My wife, Roxy, grew up in Washington, Illinois, not too far from here. And since she can remember, she went to Crossroads United Methodist Church with her dad. Throughout the years, the pastors changed like they do in the UMC, and a number of women pastors were appointed to the church, but never as the head pastor. Roxy always thought it was cool having female pastors around the church, but they never seemed to last very long in their positions, which kind of struck her as strange. But... She knew the UMC was big on women in ministry, so so she never thought anything about it too deeply. In 2005, Roxy was about 16, and she had been feeling like God was calling her into full-time pastoral ministry, but she didn't really know who to talk to about it. Well, Roxy was in a youth group with one of her close friends, and Roxy really respected this girl's dad. He volunteered in the youth group and in the church, and she felt like it would be wonderful um, that he would be a wonderful person to voice her call to since she hadn't told anyone. So she approached him one night after youth group, and she said that she was so excited to to tell him that she was called to be a pastor. This man, matching her excitement, responded, Roxy, that's so great. You will be such a good youth pastor, to which Roxy was immediately deflated. There was never any question of her call, but there was an issue with what role she would play in the church. At that time in her life, that experience was enough for Roxy to give up on the dream of being a pastor and didn't really change until 2011 or 2012 when she became a part of Merge, the ministry she now runs, and she witnessed her first ever lead pastor that was a woman. It changed things for her and also reignited that passion to pursue a vocation in pastoring, which she is now in a position to inspire other women to follow their call in ministry. But I wonder how things would have been differently if that man would have just understood that women can, in fact, be pastors. I'm almost certain that every woman worshiping with us today, whether online or in person, could share numerous stories with this community about having someone mans- mansplain something to them, um, being told that, hey, you're a woman, you should smile more, made to feel like you were inferior. You know, you know those really annoying cultural things that men still do in our society today. But then there's probably a whole other side of stories that when, when the Bible is thrown into the mix, it takes that narrative to a whole different level. Because when people throw out Bible verses, they're trying to use them as the showstopper, right? You know, this is what the Bible says, so you must listen to me. And to be clear, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is extremely patriarchal and misogynistic. Women in the Old Testament days, they had very little to no rights at all. But then in the New Testament, you see women in leadership roles. But despite this fact... The scriptures are still used to try to limit and control women. So what are some of those biblical arguments that we've all heard before that kind of make women to feel inferior? You know, one of them is the Bible says you can't be a pastor because women are supposed to be silent in the church. And if you are a pastor, you can't teach anyone older than a middle schooler because as a woman, you can't teach men. Another one is that the Bible says that you can't wear jewelry and you need to dress modestly. And if, and if I, as a man, feel like you aren't really living up to that standard, then somehow I feel like I have the authority to try to, to make you change that. And lastly, probably the one that's done the most damage to women, because of the order and hierarchy of creation that God put in place, the woman came after the man. So the woman is to submit, there's that famous word we've been waiting for, right? Submit to the man's authority. Those are just three of the many examples of biblical arguments used against women. But where do those come from? Where do those arguments come from? 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 14 pretty much sums up all of these examples. And we're going to look at that text in just a moment. Have you ever been deep into a book? You know, like a book that you you can't put down. And then life gets crazy busy, so you don't read for two weeks or so. And when you return to the book, you pick back up from where you left off. But you've kind of forgotten the immediate context of the story. Roxy uh, bought me a book recently called Hope Never Dies. And this book is hilarious if you want a fun read. It's a story about my guy, President Obama, and then Vice President Joe Biden, uh, written from Biden's perspective. Their term has come to an end 
you know, they both moved apart from one another, and all Biden wants is his best friend back. He tells one for funny story after the next about all of the crazy shenanigans him and Obama got into. And, and then out of nowhere, the leader of the Secret Service calls him one night and, and asks him to get a hold of Brock because they need to solve a murder together. And they have to rid the United States of the opioid epidemic. This is a fictional piece, by the way, but it's absolutely brilliant. Well, the last couple of weeks has felt nonstop for me. So I didn't pick it, pick this book back up until this past Tuesday night, and when I opened it up, I was completely lost. I had to back up and reread the previous two chapters just so I knew what was happening. Context is pertinent, right? I know I've shared with you one of my favorite phrases in the past, but I'm going to share this with you again because anytime we read a piece of scripture, we are all bringing our own perspectives and backgrounds and baggage, and all the other junk that we want to bring to the table. It just happens to show up. We all see life through a different set of lenses, so talking about the historical background and context allows us to learn kind of from the same starting place. Here's one of my favorite sayings that I use a lot and I tell myself a lot. A text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. Meaning the Bible was written to a specific group of people during a specific time, for a specific reason. Now with that in mind, let's take a look at 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 14. It says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a worm, woman learn in silence and with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. Wow, right? So let's ask some questions here. What's going on in this story? First, who wrote this letter? The largest majority of scholars agree that 1 Timothy was not written by Paul. And that's important for the scripture today because the message written in 1 Timothy contradicts the message Paul has preached elsewhere. In Galatians 3.28, Paul says, There is no more male and female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And then uh, in Acts 16, we find out that Paul appoints Lydia, who was an entrepreneur who converted to Christianity, to begin the first house church in Europe. In Romans 16, Paul refers to Phoebe as a minister. She's appointed to that place. And lastly, Paul is excited to talk about Priscilla, who was a prominent minister in Ephesus, and she had a more prominent ministry than her husband, Aquila. It's also been speculated that she may be the author of the book of Hebrews, but we don't know. So hearing these just four examples, we can see how scholars easily deduct that Paul was not the person writing 1 Timothy because Paul pushed for inclusion and forward progress for minority groups. So we have someone writing on behalf of Paul to a young pastor named Timothy, and Timothy lives in Ephesus. We talked about Ephesus briefly when we studied the book of Ephesians, so some of this information may sound a bit familiar. But the city of Ephesus is located in what is now modern-day Turkey, and it sat on the Aegean coast. That's important because water brought jobs. Jobs brought money. Money brought life. Ephesus was a bustling, diverse city of about 100,000 people, and it housed one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. Now, why does the temple of Artemis play such a huge deal in the scripture? Artemis was the local goddess of hunting, wilderness, and fertility, and was widely worshipped by the constituents in Ephesus. Because Artemis was a woman, women were superior to men in that region. Women were allowed to be educated, and they were allowed to serve as priestesses to Artemis. Men who wanted to serve Artemis would actually castrate themselves in order to become more female-esque. So, as, feminine grows, as feminism grows in America, 
You know, we're still thousands of years behind Ephesus, not nearly as powerful. Now, Timothy is sent to Ephesus to start a faith community based on this new movement of people who are proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah and that he rose from the grave. And he does that. He, the, the church is eventually started and people in Ephesus start converting to Christianity. So, contextually speaking, you have these new women converts who held a place of power and prominence in their city and as priestesses for Artemis. And ultimately what they start doing They begin teaching false doctrines about Jesus in their faith communities, which false teaching is the primary concern for the entire letter to Timothy. Despite having a change of faith, these women are used to being in control. They're used to being the teachers in the temple, and they're the exact same person, only Christians now. So they're doing what comes naturally for them as female leaders. They're speaking out. But the problem is it's causing disturbances in the church because their theology was a bit off. What the author of 1 Timothy is doing is addressing a group of women who were false teachers influenced by the Artemis faith system in which female supremacy was the norm. He's saying, hey, instead of teaching about this new faith, first learn about this new faith. And after you've learned, you will be able to discern between the proper teachings of Jesus and that of someone else who is pushing an unaccepted doctrine. I mean, if anyone here today started speaking up and began saying untrue things about Jesus, I would kindly ask you to not do that. It's just common sense. Contextually speaking, this is exactly what was happening back in in Timothy's day. So we can see with a little context and study of of the historical background of Timothy's circumstances, it's easy to see why what was written to him was important for his cultural context, but not for ours. While those particular verses may not be relevant for women in our day and age, thankfully so, this letter is still important for us to see how far we've come as a society and for women's rights, and it also shows us all the work that still needs to be done in our world. So then how do we, as a denomination that holds an egalitarian view of gender equality, continue to push for female empowerment? Locally speaking, we can support our very own UMW, the United Methodist Women. This is a group that, as you may know, does so much locally, statewide, and across the world. And if you're not in person, if you're listening online, we have a handout that was put into our bulletins because it's the Monunk United Methodist Women's Sunday this this Sunday, and it tells all of the wonderful things that the UMW does. So we can easily help them out. We can easily continue to support this wonderful ministry ran by women. Another way to support female, or another way to to support female empowerment is to support female-owned businesses and organizations. A quick Google search will inform you of any female-owned businesses in your area. Plus, buying local is important for many reasons, so that's always a benefit as well. A third reason is we push. We push for women to be in places of power. Much of what we hear and see in this country alone is dominated by the perspective of a man. And and with women bringing a new and fresh perspective to things, we hear about things that are different than our own perspective. So we need to amplify women's voices and ideas. We need to amplify um, the voices and ideas that, will, that are different than our own and that will be extremely beneficial for us to see in a different perspective. And if those things aren't easy enough, we can all participate by coming together as a people and taking a stand for women's rights and freedom. On Saturday, October 2nd, beginning at 10 a.m. at ISU, there will be a women's march. And we can all participate in that march and show our camaraderie for all of those who are impacted by oppressive practices and policies. My wife is bringing many of her students, and there are a number of churches from Bloomington Normal who are participating. If you're interested, we would love to have you join us. Just go ahead and, uh, and ask me after service about it if you have any questions. As culture and society continues to progress, the church must change as well. And it's our responsibility as followers of Jesus to do whatever we can to usher in the kingdom of God and fight for all of those who aren't considered equal simply because of gender. 
that verse in First Timothy that's been so much used for oppressive natures of women and to consider women inferior and to make women submit, that may have been culturally relevant at a certain time for a certain reason. Um, and, and oftentimes when we even hear about that, it still seems oppressive um, because of the way that it's translated. But we can see that that's not a universal standard for all women. We as a church must stand up and fight for women's equality. Amen.